Rachel Maddow is the longtime host on MSNBC, known for her sharp analysis of the political world, also for her books. They include Drift, Blowout, and Bagman, and now there's a new one. It's called Prequel. It traces America's long fight against fascism within its own borders, including Nazi attacks on our democracy before World War II. These were attacks that many Americans sympathized with and supported. And Rachel joins us now. It's so good to have you here. It's good to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Um, I know you walked in. I go, she's here. <laughs> she's nice here. Yeah. We have so much we want to talk to you about. Yeah. But let's start with the book. Because when you gave a galley to your father, and I mentioned this in the tease, he <laughs> yeah. thought it was kind of dark. Yeah. But then when I hear you talk about it, you're quite energized because of the way things turned out. So let's take the dark side first. How close were we leading up to World War II with America being toppled from within? The United States was subject to all the same things that all the other major democracies in the world were subject to at the time. Germany falling to Hitler, Italy falling to Mussolini, Spain falling to Franco. We had the British Union of Fascists in Britain. We had a big fascist uprising in France that actually overturned their elected government. All of those international winds blew here too. And there was a surprisingly large, surprisingly influential movement of Americans who sided with Germany, who wanted us to fight on the other side in that war. And I think we've forgotten it because of the way it worked out. You know, we won it's easy to think. We were the good guys, they were the bad guys. We went over there, beat them, and it was over. But there was a lot uh, here in the United States to contend with in terms of people who sympathized with what Hitler was doing and who wanted a version of that here. And so you've got the most famous figures in media, in business, and not only people working outside the halls of power, but members of Congress who are also sympathizing uh, and supporting. And supporting. And there are weapons, and there are militias, uh, and there are actual plans. What stops this, and what lessons are there in that for now and for the future? The big lesson is that you kind of need everything. So you've got 24 members of Congress who are working with a Nazi agent on a plan hatched by the Nazi government in Berlin to propagandize the American people. I mean, these are members of the United States Senate who were on the Nazi payroll. Um, it's shocking to hear about it. Um, but there was also, you know, there was a big prosecution. There was the Great Sedition Trial of 1944, where 29 different Americans involved in this plot were put on trial. There was incredible journalism. There was incredible activism where people infiltrated these groups to figure out what they were doing, to publicize what they were doing. One of the biggest takeaways is that, you know, not any, not any one thing works as a silver bullet, but when the American public learns about these things, when they get exposed, they tend to vote no. And when it involves electoral Official, elected officials, they tend to vote them out, which is but, what happened to a lot of the bad guys um, in this But book. your book also highlights the connection between anti between anti-Semitism, between Semitism and, and fascism. Yeah. And that they were so deeply intertwined back then. Yes. yes. And now we see the rise in anti-Semitic attacks here in this country. Now in 2023, Rachel. Yeah. I mean, doesn't that, shouldn't that set off alarm bells about where we're going? Yes. It's so frightening. It me. is a huge red flag. And I feel like the thing that became more clear to me by looking at this other time in, in our own history, it's one thing to see it in another country. It's another thing to see it in your own time. Yes. But seeing it in our own country in another time, for some reason for me, is very clarifying. And I, it made me realize that anti-Semitism and not just talking about a disfavored minority like they're bad, but coming up with these toxic conspiracy theories they're not just bad, they're secretly in control, they're secretly powerful, they're secretly behind all the bad things in the world. That kind of conspiracy theory is really politically useful to people who want us to get rid of our democracy. Because mm. they're trying to say, you know, hey, democracy is where we're all participating as equals in a decision about what the country should be like. If you're led to believe that there's some secret group, some minority that's evil, that's working against everybody else, well, that's, what that's telling you is that we can't be in a democracy together because we need to be protected from those bad people. It works the same way then as it does now. Let's talk about the results yesterday, some of them. Mm. That's why it's so great that you're here yeah. today of all days. Yeah. Big wins in Ohio when it comes to abortion rights, big wins for Democrats in Virginia. And now people are saying, well, this is a really good uh, indication of how 2024 could go. Do you think that's true when so many people are saying Joe Biden at the top of the tip, Joe Biden at the top of the ticket may not be the way to go? So many people do not feel he should run. Even people who like him and yes. who are Democrats. Yes, yes. Well, we're in this, you know, I, I feel like it's this very... And I know it's a long time. It's a long I, time. I we still that. have a year yes. to go before the presidential election. I feel like it's, it's a very Democratic Party thing right now to have... Joe Biden at the top of the ticket. Since we've had Joe Biden at the top of the ticket, they Democrats won the presidency. 
Um, they did fantastically well in 2022, far exceeding their expectations. Now in 2023, far exceeding expectations, winning the Kentucky governor's race, taking the Virginia legislature, taking a Pennsylvania Supreme Court seat. I mean, every basically everything they could have won, they won. Then why are Democrats still so worried? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly the way the Democratic Party is worried. Yeah. To have poll numbers that make you feel bad, to spend all of your time panicking while you keep winning election after election after election after election. And it's almost the opposite side, the, almost, the opposite scene on the Republican side. With Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, they lost the White House, they lost the House, they lost the Senate, they had two impeachments, they've got 91 felony counts against the guy who's at the top of their ticket, and they feel absolutely as confident as they've ever felt about their chances. So I think it's more about the mindset of the two parties. Even when Democrats are doing great under Joe Biden, all they want to do is panic. Sure. But but what's the point you're making? That Democrats shouldn't that they panic? they shouldn't panic? Yeah. I mean, because... Yeah. Democratic election results since Joe Biden has been leading the Democratic Party have been excellent for Democrats. But is that and because so the of... Poll, the, I, okay. the polling results, sure, are, 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 are worrying. Troubling, for, yeah. And it means that the, the Biden re-election effort needs to, you know, double, triple, quadruple its efforts. But the actual, the only polls that matter are are the votes. And the votes that have been cast in every election since Biden has been at the top have been great news for Democrats. But you hear from voters who say already that they are prepared, if it's a Biden-Trump matchup, to vote down the ticket, vote for who they like, but leave the presidential race blank. That's yeah. got to be worrying news, not just a bad poll result for Democrats. No, surely. And, you know, the polling, as I said, like for the, if I were part of the Biden re-election campaign, I would be, you know, up all night and staring at the ceiling and, and worried. But everybody working on a presidential re-election campaign should always feel that way. I mean, I don't know that they need to change course so drastically, given the way the Democratic Party is performing under his leadership. Things Let, seem let's, so stuck. Let's talk yeah, about yeah, Donald Trump yeah, on yeah. trial. He's, Speaking of Trump. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he took the witness stand on Monday. And once yeah. again, you hear that phrase, we've never seen anything like this before yeah. with his behavior in courtroom and the way the, the judge responded. It was just... You know, a lot of people, you know, jaw dropping. What do you make of, of the trial? Ivanka's going to take the stand today. Yeah. And his chances, because the more he seems to be in trouble legally, the more his numbers go up. Yeah. And again, it's poll numbers. It's not votes. We'll see yeah. how it plays out if they decide that they're going to be, the Republicans are going to put him as their, as their nominee for the presidency again. He is proposing a very, very, very radical departure from previous American Democratic norms if he is reelected. Um, and this, he's already telling us, telling us that ahead I mean, of time. I yeah. if, you know, Washington Post reported this weekend that he plans to invoke the Insurrection Act the first day of his second term. What, the Insurrection Act lets you deploy the U.S. military against American civilians on American soil. Why do you want to do that on day one? Like, the, the, the kind of things that he's promising are very, very radical changes for the country. Well, it's a reminder that your book is called Prequel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, living yes. in the present time, as they say, yes, in exactly. the acting world. Uh, Rachel Maddow, thank you very much for being here. Thanks uh, for having me. Prequel is available right now wherever <laughs> you like. like to buy your books. It's a recognizable cover.